Okay, you ready? Let's do this. I'm Kelly Mitchell, the Wine Siren, and I am here today with Atelier Melka's uh, head of winemaking. His name is Mayan Kozitsky. Mayan, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. I'm so excited to like you know get into the conversation about wine and winemaking because you have an extraordinary background. I mean, you moved from well, you moved from you were in engineering. Yep. In Israel, right? That's how I started my school. I went to engineering in the beginning. And so when you're going through this engineering career, you're starting your career, how do you make the pivot into wine? What happens? Well, I'm coming from a farming family. So okay. I, I was grown on a farm in a community village and was always in fruits and vegetables, but never into winemaking. But definitely in Israel in the last 20 years, wine became a very important part of the agriculture of Israel. And uh, I was I started to like more and more the idea of switching to go into something that will bring me into the farming, back to the land and not just sitting in a computer. And I decided to explore that. And part of the engineering was uh, in the end, you know, winery is a, it's a factory. So we work with machinery all the time and work in the vineyard. So it's part of the artistic side with all the um, pretty much uh, all the winemaking and the chemistry side so I found it fascinating. So let's get into the chemistry side because you had an interesting education from the standpoint of being involved with somebody who is very uh, detrimental to uh, winemaking chemistry and the knowledge of that. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Sure so so when I started um, I started in 05 but I switched in 2008 and I went to work for Dr. Margalit and Margalit was a, he's a chemistry professor that was working in Davis for many years as a professor, a chemistry professor, but he also wrote very famous books about uh, chemistry of wine and wine technology. Um, and uh, went to be his winemaker and started to work with him and learning a lot from him. It was very interesting. He's still alive, he's 76, he's very healthy. Oh my goodness. And he's still making the wine and the winery is still operated in Israel. And, so I went to work for him and under his umbrella, learning a lot for for, for really three years, uh, making wine with him and his son uh, together. Amazing. Uh, it was That's a great amazing. experience. So for all you wine geeks out there, wine nerds, um, I would definitely look this gentleman up. Margalit? Margalit. Dr. Margalit. Margalit and Dr. the winery Margalit. called uh, Margalit Winery. Uh, Margalit Winery. Yes, okay. It was the first boutique winery in Israel. Wow. It started in 86. and. Dry farmed vineyards. Uh, he's making uh, red wines only, Cabernet Franc, and a lot of uh, Bordeaux blends and uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. That's Sounds fun. delicious. Yeah, great wines. Okay, so so we're with Dr. Margalit, and then something happens to move you closer to the U.S., but not yet to the U.S., right? Um, almost. It was. Uh, we started to think about moving to the U.S., and we've been traveling a lot to the U.S. with my family, and then when my wife and I really decided to explore the option of coming to Napa and maybe go to Davis to do a little more uh, studying. And that was the switch with, I met a friend that it was all a matter of timing, but he was moving back from Napa to Israel and started to tell me about Napa and that I should explore doing a harvest in Napa before going to school. And uh, that's kind of how I rolled to Napa in the end. That uh, came here for work, for, for harvest. And you've worked for some pretty big brands in the past. I mean, we're talking about Screaming Eagle. Uh, so yeah, I was lucky when I decided to move here in 2011, I applied for a few options of uh, internships. And from here to there, my resume went to Screaming Eagle and they invited me for an interview. And uh, I didn't really knew the name, so that's to be total <laughs> honest, but uh, once I understood how important brand it is and how much I can learn from that kind of opportunity, um, I applied for the internship and after being a winemaker for five years, it was a, an interesting experience to go back to be an intern, the option to go back to be an intern and do, go back to the basics and make the wine. So that was how I flew in for an interview at Screaming Eagle and they gave me the position for the harvest of 2011 and I uh, went back home to my wife and I said, okay, that's, we're doing it. And we decided to pack the bags and flew in oh. in the beginning of July. I love it. So Screaming Eagle, for those of you who don't know, it's a, cons a direct-to-consumer brand 
but the price point on these wines is incredible. What is, yeah, what is the so price point nice, range about? 850 bucks a bottle. So $850 and you know, you can sign up for the club probably uh, or are they full up? So there's about 15 years waiting list. 15 years waiting list. Oh mm. my goodness. And so if you end up on the list, you can, you have an allocation, which is three bottles and you buy the three bottles and if you don't, you're out of the list. You're so. out. Oh my goodness. And, okay. Uh, so this is some pretty coveted juice. In uh, terms of it's a state winery and all the vineyard they own the vineyard control the vineyard and uh, it's amazing wine what was the experience like for you how do you feel that that kind of set the precedent for you as a winemaker I mean you've already had some other really incredible experience did this change your views at all on how you uh, make wine or it was my first harvest in the United States when I moved here and I definitely learned a lot about uh, technology. Mm -hmm. it was the, it's a brand new winery. Back in 2010, they finished to build the winery, and uh, they had every tool in the, that you need. And brand new winery, brand new tanks and equipment. And I was lucky to work with a very young guy in 2011. He's, he was the winemaker, Nigi Slason. And um, I learned a lot, for sure. It gives, although I had a lot of experience in the winemaking, but never in such a high level. And just to have the opportunity to see that they don't save in anything and we're gonna make the best wine ever it doesn't matter what it's gonna cost us uh, wow so that was a huge opportunity and an experience of uh, chasing perfection almost that's incredible so if you're you're thinking about making your own wine and you want to command $850 a bottle cost means nothing and you make the per most perfect wine you can you know in the end in the big start from the beginning you need the right vineyard very yeah. true, and yeah. they have that. They have that. <laughs> okay. and then they can go from there, but without the site, the vineyard, and, and the passion of the owners, I don't think it would have been happen. And speaking about passion of the owners, now you're, um, you're partnered with Philippe Melka, who has a very powerful name as well in this, um, in this valley and beyond. Um, tell me a little bit about how that came about and where you aligned your your desires to make you know some of the world's best wine in Napa so after coming in 2011 working the harvest I ended up staying at Screaming Eagle uh, worked there for a few years and I met Philip through a mutual friend a winemaker uh, Cameron that was the winemaker at Dana Estate which is another uh, very high-end estate and after meeting Philip he's coming from Bordeaux um, been here for 25 years working with very important brands and making very important wines and uh, in the Napa Valley for so many years. I, I just had the opportunity to join his company and I joined as a winemaker and uh, later after a year I took over as the director of winemaking and running the day to day. And for me, Philippe is kind of a person that um, he is super passionate. He's an artist, he's a true artist and with a lot of the background and the chemistry and he understands vineyards but, but he's a true artist of what he does and he loves what he does. and. And this company, you can see what it does for 25 years. A lot of the wines that we are making, he's been making them for 20, 21 years already. So, And he's got his own brand, but you are also creating magic for a lot of other very big brands in the Valley. Yeah, so Philip owns Melka Wines uh, with his wife, Cherie. And they just built a winery on Silverado Trail. Uh, but we... Is it open? Yeah, it's... Well, Almost? Well, it's, the winery summer? is ready. We are... Actually, just putting all the equipment in, and this harvest will be the first harvest. Excellent, that's very so, exciting. Very exciting for yeah. him, for sure. Good stuff. Uh, after 20 years, that's its 20th anniversary this year. So wow, so very exciting for Melka wines. And uh, but Atelier Melka is the consulting company on the other side. That that's is Philippe's baby since day one, and we work with different leading brands uh, like Lael Vineyards and. Uh, Moonsai and Royal Estate and uh, Fairchild wines and more. Then we we craft amazing wines and we're very lucky to source from all kinds of vineyards all over Napa. It's over 20 brands, right? It's a little under 20 brands and we do some international consulting as well. Okay. And um, But brands from all over, from Coombsville all the way up to Calistoga. And, uh, we're, it's a lot. We're learning a lot and we have a good team. Do you have a favorite um, varietal that you like to work with? You know, Napa is, is the, the world of Cabernet. Oh, yes. And uh, as we all know, so we make a lot of Cabernet. But but I enjoy all of them. I enjoy working with, uh, we make a lot of Sauvignon Blanc. And now we started to make more and more Chardonnay from Sonoma as well, which is, uh, oh, it's fantastic. a lot of fun, for sure. And uh, we did some Pinot Noir as well this year. So that was also a great uh, learning experience. Uh, but in the end, 
Cabernet is all, that's what it's all about. So Cabernet Sauvignon or Bordeaux varieties in general. Uh, but for me, my passion, I, I enjoy everything. I enjoy the challenge and I make Syrah as well and I make wines in Israel, which are uh, Rhone blends and some other whites. So I, I just enjoy crafting all those wines. Well, for people who are out there right now listening and they don't really understand the difference of Napa Valley versus the rest of the U.S., what kinds of things would you share with them to, to help them understand really the importance of Napa Valley and the quality of the wines that are made here? So I think it's, you know, in the end, it's all go back to the soil and to the terroir, what we call it. Uh, it's an amazing site. It's a, a lot of diversity in a very small place that uh, we can see it from every appellation, the soil profiles and all kinds of soils and the weather, the, the very unique weather we have in Napa between the warm summers with cool days, cool nights, a kind of cool weather that we get from the, uh, from the Bay Area. And then we had, this winter was amazing for us, a very wet winter, but most of the winters are pretty moderate winters. And it's just, it's one of those places that every vineyard tells a story. And it's not one big place that we make wine. And I think that the diversity of this place is what makes it so unique. That's a... Excellent, thank you. Um, I'd also like to ask, well, ask you to speak to people who are either thinking about getting into the wine space, because a lot of people are, you know, outside looking in now. Like, where should they start if they if they have an interest in either making wine or becoming part of the wine industry um, from a winemaker standpoint? Like, what's the first thing you should do to get rolling? First, I think you should think about it many, many times before you do it, <laughs> because Napa Valley is a small place and everyone wants to be in Napa Valley and it's oh, yes. very, very expensive. And people say that our wines are expensive, but the truth is it's very expensive to make wine here as well. And it the is. grape price is going up, the real estate price goes up and labor became very tough to get and every, the, everything goes up and very expensive right now. So I would say if you really have can afford it, and uh, you want to get into it, you can do it, but start with drinking wine and really be sure that that's your passion because it's going to cost you a lot of money. It takes time and yeah. you have to be very patient. And, and then you have to decide who you want to be. You want to find a place and buy a vineyard and, and make your own statement and find your own site. Or you want to make a Napa Valley Cabernet and then you should look at what kind of wines you like to, to, to drink. And I always say that Make sure you make something that you like to drink because it's have to come from here. So it's have to come from the heart. You know? Absolutely. And I think that's that's the key. And then you can go and chase winemaker or grapes and, and everything else <laughs> you need to make the wine. You know? And have a lot of sleepless nights yeah. and watch the money fly out the window Absolutely. for a few years and before you, have to be you start patient. selling it, right? It takes two, three years and a lot of money until you even have the first bottle. It's like at least six figures, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. It depends on the amount and what you want to make. but. Cabernets in Napa, the, the average price is above 7,000 a ton, which produce up to seven to about 50 cases of wine. So wow. if you're starting to think about the numbers, it comes up pretty quick. Absolutely. If you would speak to some of the people who are, um, you know, what my goal, part of my goal is, is to get people unstuck. Because in the wine mm -hmm. space, like when you're a consumer, it's really easy to get stuck. You get a, a brand that you either like or a grape that you always gravitate towards. And there's so many beautiful wines out there and so many different varietals. How do people kind of get unstuck? What do you recommend that they do to, yeah. to open their eyes a little bit? You know, for me, it's always, you know, I'm a winemaker, so people always ask me, what should I buy? What should I drink? Uh, for me, it should you should explore and see what you like because there is no recipe and wine tastes different from different places. Even Cabernet can taste very different from Napa Valley to Central Valley to cold, cooler area to Bordeaux even. So I think you have to explore, you have to taste a lot of wines to start learning about your palate and read. And you can read and learn more and explore. That's the best probably best way. I love it. And uh, But in the end, you also can... You, we're, we're talking about Napa Valley, we're talking about Cabernet usually. And price points can go very high, very quick. Mm -hmm. So I always recommend to find the lower price point that you can find that you like and grow from there. Because if you're going to drink a Screaming Eagle, it's going to be very hard to go back. Oh, seriously. So, if you can afford it and if you can wait 20 years to get on the list. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. But 
if you find the, the good Cabernet on the 80, 100 bucks that you really like, start exploring wines on the same price or, or price um, range from different areas and different winemakers and see what kind of style of wine you like. And there is always the wine critics that each wine critic has his own identity and you can, yes. you can read the, what they write about the wines and see if it's actually, you understand what they're talking about and, and you can find the wine critic that fits for you. Which is and if you important. like it. Because and if you like it in the end. Everybody's different, right? Exactly. So that's why you have to find the wine critic that has the same palette as you. Because Absolutely. wine critics have different palettes. Definitely. So if I were in Mayan Kashitsky's cellar, what would be the wine in your cellar that I would go, <gasps> You know, I'll have to say Israeli wine, but... Uh, okay, so, tell us a little, uh, let, like, let's get into the Israeli wine a little uh, bit because uh, I know nothing about it. So Israel has been booming in the last 10 years and we make beautiful wines. A lot of, uh, we're still exploring as a young industry, mm -hmm. um, but very talented winemakers. We have a new master of wine. The first one, uh, Iran Peak from Israel. Oh my goodness. And uh, making incredible wines and studied here in Davis and went back to Israel. And there's a lot of young generation winemakers that studied all over the world or people like me that went to work abroad and brought a lot of knowledge back to Israel and making wine now in Israel. Beautiful. Um, so a lot of Rhone varieties, uh, more and more whites. We have even a winemaker. My first mentor is, uh, he actually just started a new winery that only makes white wine. So. Wow. So people are really still exploring to understand what to grow where, but mm -hmm. the quality is unbelievable. Yeah. So, but if you go back to my cellar, I probably I, you will you will love my screaming eagles. <laughs> I'm that's, sure that's I will. the first one you're gonna. <laughs> you probably wouldn't at. get me out of there. Yeah, I'd be exactly. like, "Where's the corkscrew? I'm gonna close the door now." <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, so tell me a little bit about the terroir of Israel. What is it like, and and how many different maybe AVA type areas are there so it's it's funny because i have a lot of very very good friends and educated people here in napa but when you talk about israel and you ask them about israel they will all tell you that it's one big desert and i'm that's what people have the perception it's you know it's probably a big desert with camels walking around <laughs> but the truth is the judean hills is one of the most important appellations which is around jerusalem okay and uh it's it's a mix of soils but a lot of limestone starting at the bottom and changing to clay and uh white wines and um, very good for Merlot and Syrah and uh, Cabernet as well. And then wow. the second biggest population is the north part of Israel, which is uh, Upper Galilee, which is very close to the border with Lebanon. And so we have to go to the mountains to get a little bit cooler weather or cooler nights at least. Because okay. the temperatures are higher, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, not as high than, it's pretty close to here to be honest, but the nights are not as cool as here. Got it. So we have to go to the, the mountains to get the cool breeze at night. Uh, so it can go up to 6,000 feet altitude for vineyards on the north side of Israel. And there's a lot of tufa soils over there. Okay. And very good for Cabernet and making some Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc from there. Fantastic. Yeah. You have your own project that you're working on. Yeah, so after six years in Napa, or well, five years, I decided to to start it as well. It's, uh, I, I just, it felt right for me. I, I partnered with uh, the owner of Silverado Farming Company and mm -hmm. the viticulturist Miguel. And we started a, our own brand that um, it's going to call Lapel Wines. And Lapel. Lapel. How do you spell that? L-A-P-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. And uh, in French means the shovel. And, and our story is we went to that name and the brand because that's who we are. It's uh, the farming side. We which digging the soil and planting those vines yeah. and all the way to the winemaker that once the tank is dry and we are ready to go to barrel, we drain the juice to the barrels and we dig the tank out with the shovel. So it, it felt wow. the right the right tool to close the cycle and the tell the, the cycle of the brand. And uh, so that's going to be our logo. And so we're still working on the label, but we're getting close. And, and the first vintage that is going to be released is? So we're going to bottle Sauvignon Blanc this year. Okay. And that we made uh, from dry farmed old vines from St. Helena. Mm -hmm. And then the Cabernet will be bottled in uh, next May. So, and how exciting. do people get a bottle of this fabulous juice? You know, uh, as a winemaker, I can say it's easy to make wine. It's hard to sell wine. Okay. So we're learning about that. Uh, but the goal is uh, I'm trying to make winemakers wine. I want to... I'm not looking for a very high price point. I'm looking for something, a fun, fresh wine. My Sauvignon Blanc is under 12% alcohol. So very approachable wine, very day-to-day -day wine. 
and something that you can drink at lunch and you can still be awake and work exactly or, yeah until yeah. dinner okay yeah, exactly Love not it. too heavy and yes. fresh and very fresh Absolutely. that can go with a lot of food a lot of different uh, dishes and uh, so it's going to be a wine club and and then slowly we'll branch out and decide if we're going to do a tasting room or but but for now it's small enough to to focus on direct to consumer that's going to be our goal i love it i love so it i'll get you a bottle that sounds fabulous <laughs> okay um anything that i didn't address that we should talk about um no i think you know for us as a for my main focus is atelier malka obviously and what we do here with philippe malka and uh um, just making great wines and and enjoying this valley and the attention that this Napa Valley is getting is uh, well deserved. The wines are incredible, and we have been so lucky in the last four years. Every vintage is, seems like it's better than the red, the, the one before. Absolutely, so been crafting amazing wines. Good here. stuff. Thank you so much for joining me. This was really interesting, and I know we'll have more questions. So Perfect. thank you very much. Thank you.